<laughs> Hello, we are live. So welcome back to everyone. I, I hope you have been enjoying this amazing conference. Um, the, the last session um, I just found incredibly inspiring, um, but also um, troubling because lots of things to think about that we have answers to and many that we don't. So for the next uh, 30 minutes or so between now and uh, 545, we're gonna be spending some time in something completely different, um, which is a career chat. My name is Kevin Doyle. I'm the executive director for career development at the Yale School of the Environment. And um, in that role, one of the things I have the pleasure to do is meet incredible people who are engaged in different kinds of environmental careers in academia, in the corporate world, in government service, at national uh, and international NGOs, and at startups and, and many other ways that people can do environmental work. We have with us today five wonderful people that we've drawn from the discussions that we've been having on this uh, topic and are interested now to ask them some completely different and very more personal questions about how they've advanced their career. So here the way, here's the way that this is gonna proceed. I'm going to ask each one of them in order uh, and this will be the order, Jennifer, then Catherine, then Antonio, then David, then Daniel. I'm gonna ask each one of you to introduce yourself um, by name, title, and institutional affiliation. And then when we're through with that, I'm going to throw out a first question um, about career and career trajectory, career lessons learned, and then we'll start taking your questions uh, from everyone in the audience. So by now, I think you know that the way you ask questions is not to put them into the chat, um, but to put them into the question. Um, those questions will start you know, coming up for us and um, we'll be seeing, have a chance to see them. Um, you also have a chance to upvote if you wanna support a, a specific question and say, hmm, that's a pretty good question. I think I have a version of that as well. So why don't you have it rise to the top? And then I've come prepared with some questions of my own from a career development point of view for graduates and PhD students um, here at the Yale School of the Environment. So without further ado, um, Catherine, and then Catherine, uh, Jennifer, and then Catherine, and then Antonio, then David, then Daniel, maybe we can do some introductions. Jennifer, let's start with you. Thanks so much. i um, glad to be here. I'm Jennifer Haberkamp. I'm the director of the Graham Sustainability Institute at the University of Michigan, and also a professor from practice at Michigan Law School. Great, welcome. And Catherine? Um, kia ora koutou. Um, so I'm Catherine Irons. I'm a law professor in New Zealand, um, but I got my master's from Yale uh, quite a long time ago, in the 90s, <laughs> um, and have been teaching pretty much ever since. But I wouldn't, yeah, you call it a career, it's an accident. <laughs> Happenstance. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Antonio? Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm Antonio Benjamin. I am a justice at the National High Court of Brazil. Uh, our court here appeals from the 27 state Supreme Courts, uh, less than the United States, and the five Federal Court of Appeals. Uh, of the country, again, less than the number you have in the United States. I am also the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law and uh, the lead founder of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. And a law professor. <laughs> Great, thank you and welcome. David, how about you? Hello, my name is David Cordero Heredia. Um, I'm a doctor in the science of law by Cornell University. Um, currently, I am director of the Center of Human Rights of the Pontifical Catholic University of Ecuador and a law professor. Great. Thank you and welcome. And Daniel? Hi, I'm Dan Badansky. Uh, I'm a Regents Professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. Great. So here's the way I'd like to get started. I wonder if each of you can reflect, and then um, we don't need to take it in any order, whoever wants to be willing to volunteer to go first. If there is some lesson that you've learned, it doesn't have to be the single lesson, the most important lesson, but 
something that you feel is meaningful, a lesson that you've learned that you feel has been incredibly valuable to you as you've walked through your career professionally? It might be a skills question. It might be a knowledge question. It might be a how you relate and work with other people question. It might be something about leadership. Um, and it might be something also more tactical than that about, um, you know, about, about money and advancement and how you move uh, even with inside an individual institution. So um, I think that um, all of us, as we advance, we, we learn lessons and some of which we, we think are valuable uh, for us. And I'm not gonna ask you whether you think it's in the form of advice to anyone else, just something that you personally feel was a valuable lesson learned along the way so far for you about being professional, being successful in your career so far. I, I can start if you like since um, Great. in terms of if you're aiming certainly uh, at starting at the earliest lesson um, and that's what in terms of getting me to Yale in the first place I was absolutely ignorant uh, I didn't know what was out there from New Zealand and it was simply a matter of it's like work hard get lucky right you um, you work hard you not just to not just because you want to get first in something or because you necessarily have a goal it's some suddenly things open up that you didn't know existed uh, and that was and i didn't work hard because i was going for anything i just because i enjoyed doing it you know um, i got lots of prizes and then ended up at yale and then ended up doing really fun things um so i i can i've got long lists of things i think i did wrong <laughs> and mm -hmm. very differently i've got a lot of the negative lessons um, but uh, I'm happy to start with just that one. Um, may maybe for, you want to add one more, it's ask lots of questions. There's a negative one, something I didn't do enough of, ask lots of questions, and then you don't realize you know, where you might go. Yeah, so yeah. I, that short and sweet. Thank you, I, I, I think it's valuable. And we'll, we'll come back to that thing about questioning some of the things about you think you might've done wrong, because I think all of us have a list of those as well. And we'll have a chance in this discussion to surface some of them. Lessons learned. Who wants to go next? I will. Um, one of the things that I learned for myself, and I think is also uh, a good perspective to have for people who are beginning their careers, is that as you're first making those choices about where to go next, it feels like there are all these doors open and when you go through one, you have closed a lot of the others and that can feel paralyzing. But you don't really know when you open one door where that's going to lead you. So you can't really rationally choose among those doors based on where you might end up. And an example for me, a little ways into my career was I, when I had the opportunity to go on loan from the Environmental Protection Agency to the Office of US Trade Representative, and I knew nothing about international trade at that point. I really didn't. I said to a friend, what's the gap? And <laughs> I, ended up at, I ended up at USTR. I stayed there 10 years. I led the Environment Office. It launched my whole career in international policy and negotiations. And I didn't know any of that was behind that door. Great. Thank you. I, I love that because so many people seem to be, you know, uh, put off by the idea of how can I possibly put myself forward if I don't have all the knowledge that the most important person has and the person who I'm, you know, thinking that is the definition of qualified, how can I possibly put myself forward? And yet there we go. We find that that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others, Daniel. So I'll go next. So first of all, I agree with the previous two comments, but- uh, You don't know anything about the GAD either? That's <laughs> <laughs> true. But I uh, went into academia, but then went back into government and then back into academia. So, you know, doors can open and close. Um, but I guess uh, a lesson I think I've learned is, uh, you know, so I'm fairly academic in my orientation. So I always think the key to uh, happiness in one's job is working on super interesting issues. I guess I think that is important, but I think equally important is whether you like what you're doing day-to-day, -day, sort of the day-to-day -day activity. So, you know, whether 
and so you can be, you know, some people like having a million things in their inbox and just being jumping from one thing to another. Others like doing one thing at a time. Um, some people like writing, or if you like being in meetings, very social. So you can work on an issue like climate change in all sorts of different ways. And so it's to try to find the kind of job where you're really enjoying what you're doing on a just an hour to hour basis. So, um, you know, I'm the kind of person who likes sort of more one project at a time as opposed to 10 different things I'm having to jump back and forth. So being an academic works pretty well because I can be working on one article and then finish that and move on to the next one. But other people I know that would drive them crazy. So I think the <laughs> lesson is, is um, it's not just a matter of whether the issue is intellectually interesting to you. It's also a matter of whether whatever job you go into is something where you know, just the day-to-day -day things you're doing, how you're passing time is something you're finding enjoyable or not. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I think that a lot of people have a suspicion that um, if they focus too much on who am I, what do I like, what do I want, that somehow the actual world as it exists won't be able to ever deliver that, so why should I even look for it? And yet here we are with people who love what they do and find that they're you know, quite you know, happy professionally. So others, David, do you want to take a shot? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think the best, the, the most important thing to do in a in a, in a career uh, search is uh, to look for what you love, and I, and I think that is very important. Um, it sounds like a phrase in a mock, but uh, I, I think that's that that that's what I have. Um, uh, worked for me to uh, every single project that I have been involved. I think is something that I, I was really interested in. So I know I know it's hard work, uh, but at, at the same time, if, if you're passionate about it, I, I think it, you you cannot feel the, the burden of, of all that hard work. So um, sometimes there are like best or some opportunities that look that looks uh, great, like better better paid jobs, or sometimes opportunities to go to to one or another industry or go to the state. And it sounds like it is going to be a big step, but sometimes I think it's a good idea to to do what you want to do, actually. And I think that if you are passionate about it and and you're you're going to be good at, at it and um, I think that's 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 the most important thing because uh, it also um, um, it, it also helps you to have a good life if you are happy mm -hmm. with what you are doing. Great, thank you, well, Antonio. If you I want, I, I'm I, the would, I well, I would love to hear from you if you have something you'd like to offer. <laughs> well, I think um, passion is definitely something important. But I would, uh, I would like to uh, uh, to speak to those that don't have clarity in respect to their passions, mm -hmm. and that's the great majority. And to me, law is the, a wonderful place for those that have many passions. They don't even know that they have many passions. Some of them. Others do know, but they are lost. What should I choose? And law has space for all those passions, from the most boring to the most exciting, cutting edge to the most traditional, um, to those that uh, are more selfish, um, more public interested oriented. And I would say that environmental law is among the tents within the big tent of law that offers a whole universe of, of possibilities. Because if you like torts, you have space there. If you like properties, you have space there. If you like contracts, you have space there. If you like intellectual property, you have space there. If you like history, you have space there. If you like philosophy or cutting edge issues like climate change, biodiversity, dialogues, if you want to concentrate just on the, as then, um alluded to one thing at a time you have space there so to me it's one of the most um embracing 
uh, legal disciplines uh, that we have. And my last uh, comment in this first round uh, has to do with something that David mentioned, uh, which uh, I agree, it's passion. Uh, but sometimes people tend to believe that passion is genetic. No, passion sometimes um, just pops up from, from it's, it, it's a process of discovery. You go to a place that you had no idea that, you know, that that would be your place. And then you find environmental law. And if I may, one, one last point in this first round is often those that have already identified an environmental passion, they want to go to a place that is 100% environmental law or environmental. Mm -hmm. I would not recommend that path. Mm -hmm. Because some of the most interesting uh, positions might be those that are mixed, in which your impact would be much bigger if you bring your environmental law knowledge to a place or an area or a group of professionals that are illiterate or uh, are in deep need of uh, change in their mindset and the way they see uh, the legal process. Well, I can guarantee you that on Monday morning, I'm going to have a whole bunch of uh, Masters of Environmental Management students coming to me saying, can I still switch to a dual degree in environmental law? I heard this great guy. <laughs> so, so, and I'm going to ask uh, a question that's come into the chat that I think um, I'd like to ask anyone to take it up first and then um, we don't always need to have, you know, all of you comment on each question, but if you want to, then you're certainly invited to. So here's the question. From the broader perspective of all the career paths related to environmental studies, for example, what career fields do you see as potentially approaching oversaturation versus areas that the environmental movement might be able to use more people from, but they're not entering it? So are there any of those environmental career pathways that um, we might have just too many people have said, hey, that's where I want to go, and others that we might be saying, boy, we sure wish others would choose that direction. Um, we could use more talent in that area. And you don't have to think of it in terms of knowledge of the environmental employment world, but just from what you see as you talk to people, as you walk through your careers, anything where there's too many people and others where there's not enough? Can I say that I don't think there's enough anywhere? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I mean, if you think about it, even in terms of a law degree, um, environmental law shouldn't be this little niche off the side. Like if you take that seriously that we are living in part of, uh, you know, we are part of the environment and every the whole way of life around the globe is completely unsustainable. You know, we're killing everything in our path. Um, then everything needs to be changed. And it's a bit like what Antonio was saying, was you have to infuse environment into every other discipline, every job, every mindset, you know, in the globe. Um, and so for that, absolutely everything is needed. Um, perhaps the biggest one is those cross-disciplinary ones who can say, actually, when we're deciding economics or, or you know, decision about anything, we need to include these perspectives. We need to adopt a completely different framework. You know, we need to put, I mean, even basic things like, like, you know, people talk about those, uh, like handouts in the time of, you know, COVID, you put conditions on companies receiving them. You can do the same with environmental ones. You know, it just it, the, every single thing could be infused, and which means you need everybody to be persuading decision makers who are expert in a discipline as well as more general political persuasion. Um, so I personally think it's a bit like categories of negligence are never closed, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this The categories of environmental law are never closed and they're only going to get bigger and our biggest challenge is going to be persuading the rest of the world that actually it's everywhere. Uh, and right. it needs to be everywhere and we need to put ourselves in the middle with the ecosystem around the outside right and change all of our laws and our whole ways of being um to do part of that so yeah we can't get enough people to figure out how you can help change wherever you want to we, we whatever mm -hmm. cog you want to be in that wheel you know you, we, you could find one you could make yourself one mm -hmm. 
We got a long line of applause following that. Uh, uh, Antonio, you want to share something? And then Jennifer. Yeah, just echo something important uh, that Catherine has uh, said, and perhaps to bring um, a piece uh, uh, or a fragment of historical perspective. At the early stage of environmental law, still in the 70s and in many countries in the 80s, the only place where you could go in order to, to have interdisciplinary work was environmental impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Everything else was supposed to be in boxes. If you were doing air you, pollution, you'd be doing air pollution, water pollution, uh, forest, everything uh, was organized in, in knowledge uh, boxes. Nowadays, it's precisely the opposite. There isn't, uh, it's difficult to find an area in, we, in where people are required to be 100% doing just that. Take, for example, um, biodiversity uh, policy and law. How can you do that without bringing the experts from, from uh, different areas? Uh, and not just, you know, law, policy, uh, the, the science, but also history, ethics, um, uh, and so on. The same thing with climate change. So it seems to me that it's easier nowadays uh, for the professionals to move around and, and, and discover partnerships or even build partnerships because that's precisely what is required. Even economists are nowadays part of, uh, and they have to be, uh, part of this, this, this dialogue um, in, in climate change, for example. They almost dominate um, the vocabulary and the discussions. So I agree with Catherine, and, and I um, would just make this historical connection. Great. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Thanks. I um, agree with much of what uh, Catherine and Antonio said. Uh, a couple of their thoughts are that the problems that need solving across climate and environment are so great that I can't think of any area that there are too many of. Uh, but I would also say that means that you can contribute most if you bring expertise in a particular field and look for a way to apply it to these problems. So I tend to discourage people from being generalists. Uh, at the same time, uh, what, what we're finding is that when you go out to solve these problems, as Antonio said, you need interdisciplinary teams. And so during your academic experience, if you can find ways to work on interdisciplinary projects, uh, at my institute at Michigan, we have programs for master's students and undergraduates that bring people together across all different schools and colleges to solve a problem together. That's that's the kind of training that I think employers are looking for. The last thing I would say is, in the area of climate change, we seem to have a fair number of the technological solutions figured out that we need more. But it seems that in the policy area, how you get people to adopt them, how you get the politicians to accept them, uh, is where there's still a huge hurdle. So I think we can use more people in uh, behavioral economics, in environmental economics, in the social sciences that get to how do you change behaviors and incentivize uh, people to take on uh, sometimes hard decisions. Thanks. That's great. And actually it tees up very well the the next question that's coming in on the on the questions. Um, which is getting more to the how, the, you know, some of the how things that show up in, in all of your work. Here's the question. Can you say more about the skills that are needed to convene people across ideologies and sectors to facilitate these conversations and around solutions to mitigation of climate change and also taking in on board the idea that they need to be simultaneously more inclusive of those most impacted? in other words, climate justice considerations. So if it's true that we all agree that we need to do a better job of convening people and that we also need to make sure that climate justice issues get um, in, incorporated into these discussions, what kind of skills are needed to do that? And I guess as a career development person, I'll just add, how do we teach them? 
Are there specific skills that help people do these kind of convenings better? I, I mean, there are. One of the biggest ones I've noticed, again, sort of standing outside, is is, is that ability to question, including your own position. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm just take, a, well, I can say, I mean, ethics or worldview is a classic one. If you don't question your job or your worldview, you don't think of doing something differently. Um, one that is, is very surprising for New Zealand lawyers who go to the States is a different view of what legal ethics are in a duty to client or to the court, right? And I think of something like the, the, like there are lawyers for big companies like Chevron who try and get Chevron out of environmental justice reparations in Latin America for oil spills, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And they think mm -hmm. it's their job. They think it's their job to file consistent lawsuits, to think of all of the procedural tricks in the book to get out of paying that as a financial reparation. That could be seen as an ethical, a legal ethics duty. You know, if we if we questioned where our duties, you know, lie, and if it was if we had a different idea of it's not just winning at all costs, right? I mean, that's just a real basic. One, but in terms of addressing environmental justice, the jobs people do every single day could be done with a different lens, you know, a particular one. But as well as then that bigger, you know, question your worldview in order to be able to bridge gaps. Um, I mean, there's lots of obviously all those facilitation and other soft skills are important, but there are some legal, very legal skills that we teach that make the problem worse. <laughs> and so we could aim at changing those kinds of things, even just within law schools. Very interesting. David, I, I saw a little chuckle come up for you. Do you want to make a comment about that? Well, I totally agree. Um, and, and I think one, one of the, the most important things to work in environmental justice is to, um, when, when we talk about the most impact about the, the, the climate change, sometimes those are peoples that actually get a lot to teach us and so um sometimes lawyers um approach to people with some kind of superiority that comes from the knowledge that we get from the law but actually when we talk about environmental justice to 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 approach to communities especially indigenous peoples um is is really interesting how how they to, to learn more about their world, their worldview, to uh, about their practices, about the the relationship that they got with with nature is very inspiring and also informative of what we can do about about climate change uh, regulations and and policies. So I think one 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 skill that we we got to get is um, and get all these opportunities that 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 universities uh, give us to approach to communities, to work with people that are being impacted by, by climate change and, and pollution. Um, I think that's, that's a very important part of the, of the, of the, of getting those skills from, from, from our formation in universities. Mm -hmm. Anything else that anybody wants to add about these skills, Daniel? Uh, I think you're on mute, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, my dog is barking occasionally, so I muted myself, so <laughs> I'll have to hear him. Um, so my experience in convening is really uh, at the interstate level. So I think probably the skills involved in convening vary a lot, depending on what kinds of groups you're doing the convening of. But um, but I've been involved with uh, uh, NGO that does a lot of convening in connection with the climate change uh, uh, negotiations. And so I would say, you know, what's important is skills. You have to, it's a very delicate balancing act. On the one hand, you have to create a space where it doesn't feel, the participants don't feel like you've got such an agenda, you're open to all views, you're, um, but at the same time, if you're just a blank slate, then the convening is gonna be unproductive. So, you know, I think a key skill, the preparation for the convening, the organization, um, sort of the breaking down of issues, is really important if the convening is going to be productive because countries are only and i probably this is true of anyone going to keep on going to things that are convened if they feel it's productive and to be productive it needs to be carefully structured um, i think also 
the problems I have with a lot of facilitation is the facilitators don't really know much about the subject area. Um, so the facilitation can only get you so far. I think at least in the convening I've been involved in and climate change, really knowing the issues substantively is key if you're gonna have a constructive conversation because you need to be able to understand the issues to know you know, how to push the conversation along. If you're just using, you know, just generic skills of facilitation, um, I don't think you're able to really identify where the issues lie, where the differences lie to be able to try to, you know, get countries or whoever's participating in the facilitation to actually make some progress. So I think it's a combination of being, you know, on the one hand, um, not seeming like you've got an agenda, you know, being, creating a space that, uh, allows everyone to feel like they can participate without being pushed. But at the same time, having a structured enough conversation and enough knowledge of the issue that you can at least try to push countries a little bit to, to bridge their differences. I think, you know, uh, coming from the perspective of being, you know, here at a graduate school, you know, training both uh, scholars and practitioners for environmental, you know, action and impact, I'd really just like to put a ditto on that, Daniel, that um, this combination of having the soft skills or what some people refer to as soft skills, you know, facilitation skills, stakeholder engagement skills, but if you don't have some content knowledge to, com you know, to combine with it, um, it doesn't tend to lend itself to working with people who do have that content knowledge because they, they have a somewhat of a lack of respect for the facilitator in the room if they only know facilitation skills without at least some of the content or policy or legal uh, issues as well. So I'd yes, like to you know, go yes. ahead, Antonio, please. Uh, I believe we can approach uh, your question from different perspectives. Okay. And here we have seen a different perspective, but we can also, uh, one of those perspectives is how we judges uh, play or can play a role in, in that regard. There is a big difference between winning a case, denying justice and destroying justice or the possibility of justice. Winning a case, you win on, 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 on the basis uh, of the legal arguments, of the evidence that is uh, put before uh, us uh, judges. Denying justice is when you as a judge know that that person has, um, is right, but procedurally you cannot give that right to that person mm -hmm. because of um, um, the constraints that, that you have in, in the legal system. The third possibility is one that judges should be very much aware, which is not to go into traps uh, that are nowhere in the legal system and would destroy, for example, NGOs. Uh, and not just for that, in that case, but would shut down an NGO, basically. So this is, um, it's not just a nuance. Uh, this is something that does happen more and more often. And we judges need to be aware of that. And the judicial academies and institutes need to do this, this type, include in the training uh, programs for, uh, for the judges. And it applies to the environment, but also to human rights uh, in general. And I think that's something that we as the legal profession um, should be aware and introduce mechanisms in the, into the legal system in order uh, to take this, uh, out, not take away, but to add the legal framework to the ethical foundations that Catherine uh, alluded to. Wow, thank you. Can, can I just add one tiny bit? It occurred, I used that example of Chevron and I realized I shouldn't have as soon as I stopped. I could have used Mossville. I, I watched that, um, the link last night, I'm here. Um, and just because I thought I'd miss it today. Um, 
and uh, and it's there are lawyers. I mean, the decisions that were highlighted most that made the. I mean, obviously, there's the bigger picture of this whole environmental justice, the pollution, the laws that allow that kind of thing in the first place, but are different from individual decisions about choosing how much to compensate somebody for sending them off to go live somewhere else, right? And the two people focused on in that film that were most impacted were most heavily, apart from having to move and deny the whole community their existence, was simply they had they couldn't find somewhere else to go because the amount offered was too small. That was one person's, probably one person's decision. The lawyer could have said, actually, no, you need to do something for these reasons that's a little bit different. A lawyer could have done that <laughs> if, if they mm -hmm. had been trained or thought about their role differently. Thank you. So we have about five minutes left. And um, I think that one of the questions that's come up uh, here is, is a good way to, you know, to end the conversation. And I also want to let everybody know that any questions that you've sent in that we don't get a chance to get to, we will send the questions, um, you know, on to any of the speakers who might want to uh, take a look at them. And it just for the five of you, there's not a lot of them, so don't 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 worry about an, an onslaught of 50 questions. Um, but I'd like to end with this one. Um, there was a description in the question of the complexity and the difficulty of environmental justice outcomes, and the question was. Are people who are pursuing careers in advocacy and activism, are they actually affecting the research and policy frameworks? So I guess I would uh, I would interpret the question to say, is this a direction for you know for for new people to uh, to make a difference, to make an impact, to pursue careers in environmental advocacy and activism? And Eddie, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Don't stop. Run. Um, I'll stop. No. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. No. It's uh, when you're trying to uh, make big changes, you need the whole spectrum of engagement, and activists are an incredibly important part of that ecosystem. Just as the scientists and the policymakers and the people, the philanthropists who are funding the whole thing. Um, and I would say that at least one way in my own experience that the activists come together with the researchers is uh, the whole realm that's quite certainly popular here at the University of Michigan, and I think a lot of places now, which is moving toward the co-production of knowledge where the stakeholder community, which can include the NGO activists come together with academic researchers to say, these are the questions that we need to have answered. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the academics, the researchers produce their research and then institutes like mine translate it into products that can be used by the activists to take it to the right places, to the policymakers, to the general public, to, to help change the conversation. But absolutely, we need activists. Great. Others want to make any comments uh, to the to the people who might want to pursue those careers? You know, things to think about, things to improve things to reinforce? Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think it's really important to, to remark that, uh, that to, to work for the environment needs a lot of, of different angles. So all the angles I think are important, but I, I want to, I want to underline that activism probably is the most important for me. And wh mm -hmm. why I'm, uh, I'm saying this? Well, in the last panel, uh, one of the one of the commenters to to Daniel um, remark talk about um, the civil rights movement in the United States. So as something that really got the force to change things. And if, if we analyze that movement, um, we we get we get different angles. We we get the Supreme Court that actually arrived to a decision that is probably the result of. All, all those people organizing and, and moving things from from the society. Um, so the Supreme Court got a got a, um, a big role, but no no of all of that was possible or have been possible if if there was not a, such a great uh, movement behind. So um, from the from the perspective of the of the communities, it's really important to be organized. 
um, sometimes they need translators. And I, I like to, to, to I, I teach to my students that sometimes lawyers must be translators from, from the necessities of the people to, to, the, to the language that, that the courts and the, and the policymakers are, 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 are speaking. Uh, but it's their necessities, their organization, the, the, the movement that they can, they can, um, they can uh, put together what, what is really, really important. And then if, if we get a, a, a progressive judge that is really into the rights of nature and rights of uh, indigenous people, we are helping him to be or to achieve all what he or she wants to, to, to achieve in their position of being a judge. But, but if there is no impulse from behind or from below, um, that, that, that kind of changes cannot, cannot be achieved. So I, I think it's really important to, to, to work on advocacy. And I, I, and I want to, to, to take some of what Antonio just said that is, I think is really important. Um, if you don't go to an NGO or you don't go to organizing, uh, take what you have learned about environmental justice to every place that you go. And it's going to be really important because we need people in all the fronts to, to really achieve some, some, some change. I think that's a perfect... Uh, oh, go ahead, Antonio. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know if I have one minute. Uh, I'm sure you do. Yeah, okay. So uh, it seems to me uh, that often we use the term activist without um, boundaries. It, um, I never asked myself what an activist is until I became a judge 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. Because the most activist in the broader sense uh, people that I find are the lawyers in any case. They <laughs> are actively fighting in family law, in criminal law, in any area of law for their clients. But they, that, that doesn't make them an activist. What makes to me uh, someone an activist is the fact that the person is fighting in a legal case, not just because of that legal case, but because of the broader picture. So this is one objective aspect. But there is a, a, another aspect because he or she is doing this because there is a passion, there is a belief in 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 the public good that is be, be behind everything more practical that this person is doing so it's very important that we have those actors uh, they are the voices of society and uh, to me they uh, they uh, change not just the legal discourse and it's so difficult to change the legal discourse especially especially uh, before us judges. We are the keepers of the status quo uh, since uh, ancient times. But it changes also people's perceptions, which is even more important than the perception of the judges. Uh, and my final comment uh, is about something that David just said in passing, and I wish we had more time to discuss this for another possibility. In environmental law, we don't need progressive or active judges. What is progressive and as active is the legislation that is in place, are constitutional provisions that are not vague, are not dreams, utopian statements. They come with language that is connected to rights and obligations. So the activism is in the law and we judges have just to apply those laws as we do with with everything else that is in the legal system. Great, thank you all. And I, I, I wish we could continue this conversation almost indefinitely because that's what we, we do here at the school and at Michigan and at all the other places where you are all working. So I'd like to end by asking everyone to give a please a, a big round of virtual applause to, uh, to Jennifer and Catherine and Antonio, David and Daniel, thank you. I'd also like to thank the organizers of the conference, uh, to Gerald and Kristen and Amity and all the others who made this possible. Um, I wish we were now going off to an actual real life cocktail party where we could be to have a reception together and meet each other in person. 
And maybe the day will come soon when we can actually do that. Thank you so very much. I, I really appreciate it. Pleasure.